Hello and welcome to The Future is Now, a FOB show of the digital TV channel F15. My name is Camilla Simas. I am an entrepreneur and under 30 list maker. And on my show, you will meet future builders who are changing their industries and building their utopias in their respective fields. Today, we will be talking about the future of food. Today's guest is Patricia Bubner. She's co-founder and CEO of Obillion. Obillion is the first company to bring premium lab grown meat to the market. She just went through Y Combinator. She's currently living in San Francisco and has raised $5 million to bring her lab cultured meat to the market. She and her two co-founders have uh, combined 30 years of experience in business and product development, bioprocessing and biopharma. They have managed to grow four different flavorful meats in the lab, Wagyu, wild egg, lamb and American bison. Patricia is a scientist and engineer whose mission is building a future that is morally and ethically sustainable. She holds a Master of Science in Technical Chemistry and a PhD in Biotechnology, while also doing her postdoctoral research at the Energy Bioscience Institute at UC Berkeley. Please welcome her to the show, coming from the West Coast. So hi, Patricia. So nice of you to join us and welcome to the show. Hi, Camila. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. So I've introduced you already, um, but what I will do is give a short overview of what we will be talking about today. So the overall topic is obviously the future of food. But before we get there, I would like to delve into your own story. This has been, one can say, a 30 year project in the making. So we look at your own story, your private journey that brought you here, um, or billion story from Berkeley to Y Combinator to Silicon Valley life, I would say. Then obviously what cultured means, uh, cultured meat um, means in terms of benefits and value that it brings to the world. Uh, then the problems you face with lab ground meat and the food production that you have to overcome, the stakeholders involved. And at the end, obviously where you see Obillion um, and the future of Obillion and the future of food. Before we start, I would like to um, get to know you a little bit better. And so hence, I would like to ask you three very shortly answered questions about yourself. And the first would be, what is your biggest strength and your biggest weakness? <laughs> That's a great question. My biggest strength is definitely that I'm very persistent. And if I see a goal and I want to get there, I will get there. My biggest weakness is that I'm impatient. <laughs> so waiting for me is a little bit difficult. All right. What's your life philosophy? My life philosophy is I'm an optimist. So I always see the positive in people. I see the positive in the world. And I will find a way to get there and to bring something positive to the world. And what's your work philosophy? My work philosophy is work hard, play hard. I expect a lot from myself and from everyone that I work with, but I definitely expect the most hard work from, from myself. All right, so let's delve into how this hard work ties into <laughs> where you are right now. Tell us a little bit about your journey getting to San Francisco, to the West Coast and founding this company. You know, our billion really, or the idea for making food, making the perfect food that's nutritious, that's healthy, that's flavorful, that is something that has been in my head since I was a teenager, really. And don't ask me why, but I grew up um, surrounded by farmers, by people that grow their own food. My relatives are farmers. I learned how to milk a cow at the age of six. So for me, growing up in Austria, where I'm originally from, we were always very close to the people that grow our food and that I have the utmost respect of. And also we knew where food comes from. So that kind of instilled in me this together with my always nerdiness and, and my 
my drive to wanting to understand what things are made up of, I was like, how can we really make food in a way that we know exactly what's in there and that we can design these properties, the health properties, the nutritious properties, and also the flavor, of course, which is the most important part of food. And because of that, I started to study chemistry, chemical engineering in, in Austria at the Graz University of Technology. I also got my PhD at the same university and my research at that time brought me to UC Berkeley, where I did my postdoc at the Energy Biosciences Institute with, together with a bunch of world-class researchers. And it was really this experience where not only was I exposed to people with a wide variety of different technical and business backgrounds, but also that I realized that there is a bigger picture that we as scientists and as engineers can influence with the knowledge we have. That's what really instilled in me that drive to use my skills for something bigger. To think about this, you as a teenager, 13, 14 years old, uh, and looking at food and asking yourself, how can I make this in a lab? And then also, how can I make it better to then go to Berkeley and meeting your co-founders? Um, this must have been a crazy ride, which obviously also probably you didn't really plan out because, you know, this, this is all circumstances that have to come together. But what was the environment that the West Coast fostered for you to then actually start this company and make this a first, because you are the first meat cultured company or company that does meat uh, cultured foods. And how, how does this come about really? <laughs> you know, it, the environment really is very important. And the, the San Francisco Bay Area is known for its innovation. And it actually is Silicon Valley is of course there, but we also have world-class university and researchers there. And it attracts people from around the world. It, it attracts the best talent. And I met my co-founder Gabriel at UC Berkeley. He also did his, his postdoctoral research there. And then my other co-founder, Samet, we got to know each other during my part, the part of my industry career at Biopharma. So it is really that environment, both at UC Berkeley, where there were people from all walks of life and from business, as well as from the technology side of things, as well as certain other factors. I, you know that there is a big food and slow food movement, a big loca war movement that uh, Shipanese Alice Waters, Edible Schoolyard and so on really put their uh, own, own kind of uh, West Coast California cuisine together there that is famous. And that really brings people back to the source of where the food comes from. And in the spirit of this, during my postdoc, I also started a food and agriculture project, the Millet Project, where we worked very closely with farmers, with food producers, but also with the public. And that was also one of these things that is very typical for the, for the US and for the Bay Area specifically. We immediately got seed funding with this idea from the UC Berkeley Food Institute to realize that project. So I think the combination of talent, of capital and of innovation and this can-do attitude is what makes these things possible. Yeah. And uh, so now you're growing meat. Why meat? <laughs> and uh, how long was the process to actually decide meat it is and now we have something in a, in a Petri dish? <laughs> yes, this, this really kind of goes back to partially the millet project where we were looking into grain biodiversity and into making food products and then the up and coming plant based meat alternatives that are fantastic, but one thing they are not, they are not meat. And I just find the idea as a scientist utterly fascinating that we are able to grow meat cells outside of the animal. That's my nerdiness that comes in there. And the second thought is, wait, if we can control this process, if we can do that, that has a huge impact on the environment. We know that 
over one third of the greenhouse gas emissions are due to our current food production. And a lot of that is beef production. It has a huge impact on animal welfare if we're talking about industrial agriculture, and I want to, to point that out. And it also gives us the opportunity to have a really nutritious, controlled product without any of the drawbacks of conventional meat production, speaking of antibiotic use, contamination with uh, fecal bacteria and so on. And uh, so uh, you said this already a little bit in context, but to uh, make a real comparison of what it would take in terms of resources, uh, time, money, uh, and yeah, possibly also ecological footprint to produce a kilogram of meat as we know it and produce a kilogram of meat in a petri dish. How do these two compare to each other? That's of course a very important comparison to make. And I have to tell you that because there's currently no process at scale, we just don't know. But what we know is that the energy conversion is much more favorable. It takes so much more energy and calories to feed uh, an animal to grow meat than it does if we have it in a bioreactor similar to how we make beer. And the, the exact um, savings will need to be shown once we're at, its, at scale. But there are studies and techno-economic analysis as well that uh, show that we will achieve at least a 70% reduction in water use and up to a 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emission. And that's huge. Especially if we think about the increasing meat demand and the land use that goes hand in hand with it. And that's something that we soon will not be able to ignore any longer. It's even hard right now if we look at the impact of climate change, of really um, cutting down rainforest to grow food for the uh, cattle, for the livestock that we have for meat production. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, you've went through the Y Combinator um, accelerator, you've got funding, and you're going to produce certain types of meat. Um, when we say, okay, it makes sense from an economical perspective, an ethical perspective, a moral perspective, what are the problems that you feel like you will be facing in the future going forward, taking this mainstream? Yeah, so I think the biggest problem with uh, cell cultured meat right now is the cost and hand in hand with that, the scale up process. And at the same time, I have to say, scaling up is a problem that every industry has, no matter what you produce. If that's, whether that's battery materials um, for new uh, batteries for electrical vehicles, or whether that's cell cultured meat. This is just always a, a process that requires a lot of capital and knowledge. But um, bringing down the cost for cell cultured meat will be very important. The inherent thing of cell culture is it is quite expensive. It's something that in recent decades, we saw a lot of advan advances in the biopharma because there are a lot of new therapies, cell therapies, for example, that get developed, but you can easily see that biopharma has bigger margins than food producers have. So bringing down the cost so we really can truly democratize nutritious and healthy cell cultured meat, that's one of the biggest issues that we see. Do you feel there will be a negative perception in people's mind that will view these meat as chemical, cult, chemically cultured or maybe not as pure um, or just frankly weird as we've seen with other food movements that couldn't you know, be taken mainstream? I honestly don't. I think it is our responsibility as scientists, as the companies in this space to tell the consumers the story of how we produce it. Because what frightens people is things they don't know and that they don't understand. So for us, transparency is super important. And really, um, what we do is nothing else but taking cells from an animal. And instead of having that animal grow their own meat and tissue and then slaughtering that animal, what we do is taking these cells, transferring them to a bioreactor that looks exactly like the reactors that you see in craft beer breweries. 
and we put it in a nutrient dense solution where we know every single thing that's in there and can control every single thing. And then we grow and make more meat out of that. It's truly something that is so safe and has been proven so many times in biopharma. I mean, biopharma uses this process for years and people get injected with these things, right? We only have people eat it. So I think telling this story and telling it right and saying, look, we actually can produce something that's better. That will be the story that will convince the consumer. And overall, you know, we will be able to produce a flavor that's unparalleled because we don't run into the restrictions of conventional agriculture. And if you think how and why we eat certain types of meats, it's, you know, going back to history, it's probably the thing that was the easiest to catch. And then it was the thing that was the easiest to domesticate and didn't kill you when you tried to feed it. And then the, the next part was where we live. And even now farmers are like, you know, I have this certain cattle or, or breed of sheep because they thrive in the humid area of Texas or the dry, hot weather of California and so on. We're not restricted by that. We can really make the best meat, for example, for us, that's value beef and scale it up, which is independent of the location we are in. And in that, I see us as really building on the craft of the past and what farmers have developed and just doing what people have always done, using our skills, using our craft, using our brains to ensure a healthy and stable food supply for the future generations. Um, there's a point to be made maybe that also the education around food is not what it should be and that people actually have false narratives in their mind of what is pure or unpure or healthy or should be processed a certain way. Uh, do you think stakeholders that will allow you to scale this and make this big um, will have the same interest to kind of narrow these beliefs and also give you the funding that you need in order to scale this to mass production? Definitely. We see a huge interest right now in meat alternatives in general and cell cultured products specifically. And if you look at the recent big IPOs of Beyond Meat, of Oatly and other big coming companies, the diet of the future will be very diverse. And the way I see that is that we will hopefully have a large component of regeneratively farmed food. We will have a component of plant-based alternatives, both in dairy, meat, and so on. And we also will have cell cultured alternatives and fermented alternatives. Just think about the possibilities there. All these options that haven't been available to us yet, but will be available to us in the future. So I think this is something that the big companies and also investors really see as a huge opportunity. And we see the consumers already, you know, really asking for these things more and more and more. Impossible Foods, for example, also has an ingredient that has been made in due, through fermentation. So that has been accepted by consumers as well. So I think, you know, we really go into the right direction, especially with people becoming more conscious about what their food choices mean for the environment and for the world on, at large. So looking at the future of Orbillion, where do you see yourself as a product, the different products that you will produce, um, your place in the food system, and probably also your place in the economy and in the world? when we look at global warming and the like, um, where do you see that going? Look, if I, if I dare to dream a little bit, then I definitely, see, I definitely see a future in 10, 20 years where cell-cultured meat will have a large chunk of the currently 1.2 trillion global meat market. And this is a huge opportunity for Orbillion and for other companies because it is a really big market. And if we look at all the different types of meat that we consume, not only here in the US, but in other parts of the world, there are so many opportunities to create products that consumers will love. 
And the other thing that I can see happening is that we have a more stable food supply that's independent of climate change, that's independent of other um, things that may happen, such as pandemics, although very unlikely, right? Um, typical nightmares in some canals. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, to have a really stable food supply, because you will have a system of bioreactors around the world that can guarantee a stable food supply for people around the world. Think about what kind of de democratizing of meat and of food that would mean for a lot of people right now that are suffering. I also see that we will need to scale. Within the next 10 years, we will not replace animal agriculture with cell cultured meat. We're just not there at scale yet. It is still a lot of um, innovation that is needed for us to scale to a point where we can even do more than just um, feed that increasing need for meat that we currently see, right? The demands are rising. And you can see that with uh, a lot of these meat supplies during COVID that they suffered. They couldn't supply their consumers with the things that the consumers wanted, right? So that will be our first role to really be a stabilizer there. But in the future, I really hope for a huge effect, a global effect of cell cultured meat, and especially, of course, of our billion. And when you dream up, maybe let's go back to your 15 year old self um, with everything that you know now, uh, what does the future of food look like to you? Is it going to be local? Is it going to be seasonal? Is it going to be coming out of a lab? Is it going to be uh, individualized to everybody's genome? What is there? Is there going to be a one size fits all model? What do you envision the future of food to be? I think the future of food will be all of that and more. Things that we can't even know yet because they will be enabled through all the technologies that are coming up right now. I can see even food that's personalized to your microbiome, not only to your genome. There's a lot of research going on there too. And, you know, it will be different geographically because there are regions where more and more consumers have more and more money and are willing to spend money on personalized nutrition. And then there are regions that will profit from having just a stable supply of nutritious food. And I also think that we will see that subsidies will shift to really help that stabilization of the food supply. And we will see that meat produced by farmers will get more expensive. And that's something that, again, with having more alternatives can help consumers to have a multitude of nutritious and, um, and, and affordable solutions. So I think the future of food is bright and we all can create it. And that is something where I'm just, I feel very, very lucky to be able to contribute to that shift in our food system and to creating that future of food together with my team at Urbillion. Yes, amazing. And maybe we can uh, even, you know, cure world hunger and uh, put real prices on real food and not overproduce and throw away all the time. Yes, food waste is definitely also a big problem. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, uh, Patricia. Thank you so much for your insights. And uh, I think this is a very exciting, very relevant uh, topic that hopefully a lot of people will take a lot away from. So the last bit of the interview, I um, would like you to end some sentences. And um, those are meant in a general sense. So if you think about... Um, the long-term effects of the COVID crisis um, in regards to startups. What do you think it was? Good, bad? I think the long-term effects of COVID for some startups are really good because there are a lot more opportunities for, I think, especially food tech startups, but also SaaS startups and other startups that help with um, remote work. And we see this push to a more remote workforce globally, which is, I think, super interesting since it opens up talent for global com for companies globally. Amazing. And uh, what do you envision a general utopian future to look like? 
a general utopian future for me looks like that we are able as humanity to incorporate technology and nature at the same time to be able to, you know, live together with nature and at the same time use the technology that we have for the better of humanity and every every other living being on this planet. So I really think that we're on the right track. We just need to be a little bit faster. Like always. Speaking um, of being impatient, right? <laughs> <laughs> what do you envision a dystopian future to look like? A dystopian future for me is a future where we continue to exploit our nature, our natural resources, our human resources, and to not, to not embrace the things that we can do and instead dwell on the things that we can't do. Which uh, a lot of people love. Um, and a future builder I should definitely interview on my show. Yes, I think you should definitely talk to Luciano Bueno from Gali and ask him about his view on how we will dress in the future and how that will be produced. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was very insightful. I loved every bit of it. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you for doing this early in the morning. You are uh, at the West Coast. I'm at the East Coast. So um, love that we could make this happen. And I'm sure we will uh, have a follow-up interview when, you know, we, we can deep, di deep dive into the problems that arise, but also the successes that you've had along the way. Absolutely. And thanks again for having me. Absolute pleasure to be interviewing with you. And I thank you uh, for watching. We love for you to su subscribe our YouTube channel. I hope you found this interview as insightful as I did. And uh, you share and uh, comment. And as always, we see each other next week at another episode of The Futures Now.